Um, my name is Ben Blything. I'm going to be telling you how you can uh, control some electronic devices with Ruby, uh, program some electronic devices with Ruby. Before I really get rolling, there is uh, somewhere in the room right now, there's a little box with some buttons on it that's being passed around. Uh, when you get it, go ahead and pu push those buttons, and uh, these LEDs that are right here on the table in front of me, they're going to change colors, uh, theoretically. So it's been working so far. I don't know what the range is going to be, but um, in a little while, I'm going to ask for it back. But for now, just keep passing around playing with it. Um, you can push two at the same time, and it'll work. Uh, it's most obvious with red and blue. But uh, yeah, so set the sign up. OK. So uh, controlling electronics with Ruby. Uh, my name is Ben Blything. That's my email address. Um, I'm a Rubyist, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Also, uh, I'm a hardware hacker. Okay, remote's not working. Uh, I'm a member of the PDX Ruby Brigade, ah, Ruby Brigade, and if you live in Portland, you can be too. Uh, just go ahead and ask me. There's about, I don't know, six or seven other people from Portland uh, in this room right now. So uh, any of us, if you find someone that you know is from Portland, just ask them and we can tell you about PDX Ruby. I also work at a company called Leica in Portland. Uh, I get paid money to write Ruby every day. Um, and once again, you can too. Come up to me and uh, ask me how after the session. <laughs> so a little bit about this talk. Uh, it's sort of uh, demo heavy. So it's like a lecture, demo, whatever. Um, I have demo hardware for almost everything, actually everything I'm going to be showing you today. So uh, there's going to be some times where we're going to stop and we're going to actually look at some electronics and uh, see how it works. I do make a couple of assumptions about your hardware skills. Uh, those are primarily just uh, using some terminology that you probably don't need to know to pick up on what's going on. But uh, I just wanted to let you know. I, I'd be happy to explain any, any words that you don't understand. Uh, I'll be happy to explain them afterwards. Um, the demo hardware that I have with me is staying here until Monday morning. So if you want to come play with it, see it, you experiment, get your hands on it. Uh, just come find me at any time, and I'd be happy to help you uh, in that endeavor. So um, a little bit about the hardware we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to show you some X10 home automation equipment, uh, specifically the Firecracker CM17A module. I'm going to show you the Betabrite LED sign, which is this guy right here. Um, those of you who were at RubyConf last year may recognize this, Aaron Patterson. Who is Aaron Patterson here? I'm here. Hi. Um, he showed this off last year in a lightning talk, um, and we're using, or I'm using his, uh, his library to control it, but we'll talk about that later. Um, I'm also going to talk about the Arduino development board, uh, which, more details later, and the XB radio modules. Uh, Software-wise, I'm going to be showing you the uh, X10 CM17A gem by Jim Wyrick, uh, the Betabrite gem by Aaron, and uh, a project called Ruby Arduino Development by Greg Bornstein, who's a a fellow Portlander and around cool guy. Um, I am not going to be showing you any software that goes along with the XBs. Uh, I'm working on it, but it wasn't ready yet. So uh, that's coming later. Um, another note, RAD, uh, Ruby Arduino Development, I'm going to call it RAD for the rest of the talk, is pretty young. Um, but Greg and I are working together to make it really uh, kick ass. We're just, it's taking time. Before we get started, I want to give you a couple, or just talk a little bit about serial. Um, Everything that we're going to be doing is communicating via uh, serial connections of one form or another. The problem is that serial ports are rare. And if you're a Mac user, which uh, like everybody is, you know that your, your computer doesn't have a serial port. Um, a lot of modern PC laptops don't have serial ports either. USB is serial. That's what the S is. But it's not that easy. You can't just plug it in and make it work. You have to pull the, uh, the actual serial data connection out of everything else that's going on on the USB cable. In order to accomplish that, I like the Keyspan USA 19HS, uh, which I have here under my desk that's basically doing half of what's going on today. Um, they're about 40 bucks. This is sort of like the standard USB to RS-232 adapter. Um, they uh, were originally recommended to me by guys that I knew who were Mac users but worked uh, on networking gear where they had to have a serial console everywhere they went. So uh, they're, they're really solid. Yeah. I know, I will get to that. I also like the FTDI FT232R chip, which is what is in that cable that you're talking about. Uh, I have one of those up here as well. 
uh, the FT-232 uh, FT is a uh, sort of the industry standard USB to UART bridge, which means that it takes USB on one side and gives you out a serial connection on the other side. Um, every Arduino has one on board. That's, uh, that's how, this is an Arduino board, by the way. I'll show you again later. Uh, but that's how it's got a USB connection that talks to the microcontroller on it. You can also get, like you said, there's a cable that has one of those embedded in it. I assume that's what you're talking about, right? Oh, okay. Well, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, there's a lot of options. These are the ones that I've used and uh, that I like, so, uh, but feel free to explore. The point is you need USB on one side and serial on the other, and uh, you need hardware to do it. Um, so I mentioned UARTs a minute ago. These are basically the hardware devices that enable serial communication. I'm generalizing a lot here, um, and frankly, I don't understand UARTs very well. I'm a programmer first and a hardware hacker second, so just so you know. Uh, please don't call me on anything I say that's completely, well, anyway, never mind. Just going to skip that. Um, so when you have devices out there, you can connect them directly uh, via cabling, but that's usually, that sucks, usually. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can get wireless communication between devices, but some of them, uh, for instance, Bluetooth, are pretty expensive to adopt. Um, there is, a, for instance, an Arduino Bluetooth board that comes with integrated Bluetooth, and I want to say it's like 150 bucks, something like that, uh, whereas the Arduino Core board by itself is 35 So that's $115 just to get Bluetooth. Um, so that's where we move on to the XB radio modules. I really like these things. They are small, they are cheap, and they are very low power. And I'll talk about all that in a minute. Uh, these things were originally intended to implement the Zigbee spec, uh, which, you know, details in a minute. Um, but they ran into some problems with the chipset that they initially used, and it turns out that it actually can't support the functions in Zigbee. Instead, they uh, went to 802.15.4. This is the standard for sort of mesh networking that Zigbee is built on top of. Um, the XB radios are a, a UART to wireless bridge, so they, have a, uh, they basically can listen to a UART, and anything that they get on there, they just send out to the network that they've established. Um, I mentioned earlier they're low power. That uh, translates to 45 milliamps in use and 10 microamps when they're idle. Uh, what that means is if you take a standard uh, CR2032 watch battery, which is like that, it's like about the size of a nickel, it's a pretty common watch battery, one of these, when it's idle, will run for 25,000 hours, which is just shy of three years. If it's broadcasting that entire time, it'll wear down in five and a half hours. But this is a little, little tiny battery, and uh, this is a pretty, it's a one milliwatt uh, radio. So that's pretty damn good. So um, briefly, Zigbee is a standard for uh, wireless mesh networking. Um, the, uh, it's built on top of 802.15.4, which I mentioned earlier. And in some ways it competes with Bluetooth, but it had different design goals. Uh, they didn't want, uh, they, they did not intend Zigbee to be a device that you would use to communicate between two consumer level devices. It's more meant for communication between uh, industrial type devices like uh, network smoke detectors in a hotel, for instance, would be a, the kind of thing that Zigbee was targeting. Zigbee is really easy to get started with, and uh, you can basically just get a bunch of radios, put them all on the same, they call it a PAN ID, and they can talk to each other. You're done. That's all you have to do with it. But there is a lot of advanced functionality that you can build into uh, a Zigbee network just by virtue of uh, programming them in an appropriate way. You can do specific, instead of broadcasting, you can do specific uh, single casts. You can do multicasts. There's uh, routing capabilities in the Zigbee network. Um, this is the last I'm going to mention Zigbee, uh, but I just want you to be aware of it because it's really cool technology. A couple of bad things about the XB radios. I'm using the Series 1 module, and I mentioned earlier they had some problems with the chipsets and they don't support Zigbee. However, uh, they have released a Series, or they are releasing, I don't know if they're shipping yet, a Series 2 uses a different chipset and does fully implement the Zigbee stack, so uh, it can communicate with other Zigbee devices, and uh, that's pretty cool. Another thing that kind of sucks is that these modules are 3.3 volt parts. And the reason why that's bad is that the majority, well, I don't know about majority, but the majority of hardware that I work with is 5 volt. So you have to have some sort of voltage regulator or some sort of electronics in your circuit to step down the voltage to the 3.3 volts that the, uh, 
that the radio is looking for, and that can sometimes be a little bit of a pain. It's not a big deal, but it's inconvenient. The third thing is that uh, configura the configuration and firmware upgrade software is only available on Windows. Um, that is bad because you can't upgrade your firmware otherwise. However, the modules themselves are programmable using the Hayes AT command set for people who are familiar with modems from back in the day. Uh, so you can get away without it. And then, in fact, that's the, the vaporware that I mentioned earlier that I'm working on for these programs them using the AT command set. So, so that's that. Um, gonna move on now to X10. Um, X10 is a standard for mesh, quote unquote, mesh networking that uses your power lines as the medium. It was uh, intended for home automation when you want to uh, have a motion sensor outside that turns on lights inside your house, you could use X10 to accomplish that. Um, it also does things like uh, they have drape control modules, they have cameras, you can uh, build your home theater automation with X10. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of automation stuff you can do with it, and they give you some software to do it, but uh, we don't like that. Um, X10 wireless technology is the main supplier, and coincidentally, the same people who did those really annoying camera, like spy camera pop under ads, um, despite the fact that they are a scummy company, they make really cool hardware, and uh, I still recommend uh, checking it out. So specifically, the module we're looking at is the uh, Firecracker CM17A uh, module. It's very small, it's about this big. I can't show it to you because it's on a short cable under my desk. Um, but it's, it's very small, it's about an uh, inch and a half square. Um, it talks serial to the, so it plugs into your serial port, it talks serial to the computer, and then wirelessly talks X, the X10 protocol to a transceiver module. Um, the transceiver that I'm using is a TM751. This is mostly for people's reference when they're looking at the slides later and they want to buy this stuff, so yeah. Um, the TM751 doubles as a LAMP module. Uh, X10 networks, or X10 modules, describe what they can do. Lamp modules are pretty much only good for turning lamps on and off. They also make appliance modules, which I have one as well. Uh, I'm using an AM466, which can turn on heavier duty stuff like heaters or motors for you know drapes or whatever. Um, so uh, the transceiver then takes those X10 signals that it got from the CM17A and passes them over the power line network. Again, I'm, I'm generalizing a little bit, but this is the gist of how it works. So uh, I want to show you a little hardware demo. So red and green lamps. If I say green, on, red, on, green, off, and red, off. So obviously this is very trivial, but I'm, this is uh, using, well, I'll show you the code. I'll show you what it's doing. I will show you. Is this readable? Okay. I'm sorry? Barely. Okay, okay sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of the code I'm gonna be showing you today is not beautiful, and I apologize for that. Um, so basically what we're doing is just requiring the X10CM17A module, configuring it with the USB port that we're using here, or with the, uh, with the device. Uh, by default, it, it goes to TTY S0, I believe, which uh, on a Mac doesn't mean anything. Um, then telling it the device address uh, and basically taking input from the user either on or off and just interning that and sending it with uh, send, which is kind of dirty, but it's the job done in like very few lines of code, so. Um, a little bit about the addressing just briefly. Uh, X10 networks are split into homes and network, or homes and units. So in this case, B is the home code and two is the unit code. So uh, you'll see why that matters in a minute. So uh, some tips, some pro tips. The firecracker has a female, USB, or female serial and a male serial on opposite sides, so you can chain it between devices. Uh, that's how I have it configured here. Um, it's plugged into the serial port, and then I have another thing plugged into it. Um, the way that it works internally is that it basically tells the CM17A to wake up by twiddling some of the um, flow control bits on the serial port. Is that vaguely accurate, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's bizarre, but yeah. Yeah, it's really weird. So, uh, but the, the upshot is that it won't interfere with other serial communications. Um, the range of the firecracker is not 
spectacular. Uh, it has no antenna, it's just a little tiny box. I recommend that you put the transceiver in the same room, although uh, everybody's mileage is gonna be different. I live in a really old house that doesn't have any metal in it, so it works all the way across my house, but um, you know, who knows. Um, also, the transceivers don't have a unit code setting. This is why the addressing, I brought up the addressing thing a minute, a minute ago. Um, they, the transceivers are always unit code number one for whatever house code you dial in on the hardware. So that's just something to remember if you decide to play with this. So that's that. Um, we're gonna look at the Betabrite sign now. Um, again, this is the Betabrite sign right here. It's an eight color LED sign. Uh, they say it's eight color. What they really mean is that it has red and green LEDs and it can mix those to make yellow and it can dim them. So between those, three, or those things and black, they somehow come up with eight. Uh, <laughs> my experience has been it's red, it's green, it's amber, or it's a rainbow. So uh, whatever. Uh, Betabrite does make a full color sign. I don't have one. I don't know if the gem supports it or not. Aaron, do you know? No, it doesn't. Okay, it doesn't. The protocol certainly does, but uh, it probably has to be updated to a newer, newer version of the protocol. And I'm gonna mention this two or three more times. The Betabrite pr protocol really sucks. It is a huge pain. Um, upshots of the board, uh, it has some onboard non-volatile memory. So you can unplug it, plug it back in, and whatever you had programmed to it before will stay. That is, uh, it's, it's nice. They are programmable via serial, RS-232. Um, it uses a weird dongle and a big long cable, but uh, it, it gets the job done. It's still a serial connection. And these things are relatively cheap. I got mine for 75 bucks on eBay with like 20 bucks for shipping because it's kind of a big box. But um, you know, that's a, pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good price for a display like this. I want to say they're $150 brand new if they still sell them. The full color ones are $250 new. Um, the protocol, Betabrite is owned by a company called Adaptive, just as a side note. Adaptive makes really, really big, they make LED billboards, so they definitely know what they're doing. Um, and I believe that the protocol is common to almost all of their signs once the protocol is actually, like if you fully implement the protocol, you would potentially be able to program all their signs, but that's not important here. Um, I wanna take a minute to talk about how Betabrite stores data internally. Um, it has three, I believe, three different kinds of files, dot files, string files, and text files. Um, the text and string files, obviously, they contain strings. And dot files are basically patterns of pixels, so you can actually draw your own images on the sign. The text files are intended to be static, and when you replace one, it'll cause the, the sign to go blank while it, read, while it basically reprograms that text file. However, the string files can be volatile, so, and the text files can include them. So uh, you'll see a, a demo of how this works later. Basically, the, uh, the text file includes a reference to the string file, and when you update the string file, it uh, updates the display without causing it to blank. Um, so a hardware demo, again. Uh, transition was slow. So uh, I have this guy here, uh, writestring.rb, which just prompts you for a string. Um, I'm watching you guys on how to play uh, IRC. It takes a long time. The protocol is, it's 9600 baud. In fact, everything that we're looking at today uh, runs at 9600 baud. Um, and there's a lot of extra little control characters and stuff. Did that actually update the sign? Yes. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you saw how long that took. Um, it says sleeping to be sure it works. I'll get to that point in a minute. I'm actually gonna tilt this down because it's kind of distracting now. Anybody wanna see it before I make it go away? All right. We'll come back to that in a minute. So here's the code that drives that demo, and I apologize again for this being a little difficult to read. But all that's really happening here is we're opening a serial port, creating a sign, creating a text file, and writing that text file. That's why it went, it went blank there. Uh, we're writing that text file with whatever message you get. Because in this particular demo, we don't care if the, screen goes, or if the sign goes blank, uh, I'm just using a text file. Um, I'll show you how the string files work with a code demo here in a little bit. Um, a couple of notes that you see the dollar standard out dot sync. All that's for is to make the, the user's feedback a little easier. Uh, you can take that out and this will still work fine. You'll also notice the kernel dot require serial port. The reason for that is that the serial port library on Intel Macs and possibly on other platforms has a weird interaction with RubyGems require. 
So if you require it before RubyGems, it'll work fine. If you require it after RubyGems, you have to explicitly call the kernel require. I don't know why that is. I'm not sure anybody knows why that is, except for the serial port author. What's up? Uh, no. Okay, this works fine. You just have to do this, so, yeah. Um, I'll try that later. Um, and then there's this sleep one, and I mentioned I will, uh, I'll talk to you about this. Uh, a point I thought was on the previous slide and wasn't is that you have to allocate memory on these signs before you can write anything to them, and that's already been done. Um, and I'll, again, I'll talk about that in a second. In fact, I'll talk about it right now. Uh, it's important that you always allocate memory on these signs before you write to it, otherwise your write's gonna fail and you're gonna spend three months wondering why that is and then a week before the conference, email the author for help, which is exactly what I did. Um, so you gotta make sure you do that. Just always allocate memory first. As far as I know, there's no downside to just allocating as much memory as you think you could ever possibly need, uh, with the exception that uh, sometimes you may run out of a number of files if, you know, so. But it's worth a shot, you can give that a try. You should always sleep for one second after sending data but before closing the port. This is not always required. I haven't been able to find any rhyme or reason to it. Um, this was something that Aaron suggested to me. Uh, it may be an OS X only thing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I would do it just to be safe. Um, this is another symptom, I think, of the sort of uh, ghetto Betabright protocol. In the official protocol docs, it says that you should randomly delay between sending commands so that the sign can catch up. So, it's real special. Um, the other thing that you should always do is at least allocate at least four more bytes than the length of the string that you're going to put into a file. The reason for that is that there are control codes that tell, you, tell it how to animate it, what color it should be, and things like that. And if you only allocate the amount of space that you need for the actual string, it's not gonna work because it needs that extra padding. Um, I would say it, four is the magic number. At least four more would just go nuts. Uh, when I allocated this sign, every string file has um, 32 characters in it. It's allocated to 32 characters. And when I get to the demo, you see the longest string I ever put in there is like seven characters long. Okay, uh, Arduino dev boards. Can I get, uh, whoever has the button thing, can they send it back up here to me, please? Uh, I'm gonna need it in a minute. Did it leave, did it walk out? Somebody's gotta have it. Okay, yeah. Just uh, stick it on the table here, please, if you would. So the Arduinos are, um, they're uh, open source. Uh, they have an interesting definition of open source. The, the actual, uh, the files that you can use to have one of these circuit boards printed, I believe are Creative Commons. The uh, code that runs on the um, I'm not sure what the license is. The code that runs on the microcontroller is open. Um, and uh, the IDE is open as well. However, there, has been, there have been some fights, and you can look on the Arduino forums about whether or not, uh, if, if they're using the phrase open source correctly. I don't want to get into that, but um, the point is you can, build, you can get the design and build these boards by, from scratch if you want. And they definitely show you how to put them together, which I'll demonstrate here in a few minutes. But. Um, the IDE is based on processing. Uh, it's kind of ghetto, which is why I like to program these with C instead. Um, come on, remote. Oh, there we go. So uh, the Arduinos, they're based on the Atmel ADR uh, 18 Mega 168 microcontroller. This is a, a, a pretty powerful little chip. Um, some older Arduinos run on 18 Mega 8, and in fact, they're interchangeable. So if you have a Mega 8, you can program it with the Arduino uh, uh, firmware and bootloader and slap it on the board and it'll work. But the 168 is a much better chip. They're about four bucks, uh, just the chip itself. Uh, it's that, that long thing on there. Uh, they have a modular hardware design, which I'm gonna get back to, but these the pins that are on either side there, I could just slap a, a little thing on top of it, and um, that is really handy. The native language for the Arduinos is based on C. In fact, it, it really is C. What they do is they simplify it. I'm gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, first, I want to show you uh, another demo with this thing, but I'm gonna add some LEDs to this. So it's gonna take me a second to rewire this. Uh, which, so this is gonna be kind of boring for a second. Sorry.
Thank you, whoever is responsible for the soundtrack. <laughs> this, uh, this went a lot faster when I was rehearsing this in my room last night. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. I did not bring enough hardware to do the demos that I thought I was going to do. So, almost done. Almost done. Almost done. So that, it's funny you should say the blue wire because actually on the, uh, so this, this, the LEDs that I'm using here I bought from SparkFun and uh, the cable that it shipped with is actually wrong. The blue and green wires on the cable are reversed, uh, which is um, annoying. Okay, almost done. I keep saying that. This time it's true. So now, having wasted all of that time, I now have a little board where I can push the buttons on it and instead of, earlier it was wireless, now it's actually happening all on this little board and as I push the buttons it's turning these LEDs colors, which is, uh, yeah, it's really cool, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, so I want to show you the code that does that. This is the Arduino code that does this. Um, it's 33 lines long, it's not terrible. I've removed some comments and uh, there's a couple of little things in here. That, so you see I'm declaring some pins as inputs and then writing to them, which seems weird, but what that does is tells the, uh, the Arduino to enable the internal uh, pull-up resistors that are on the, uh, that the AVR provides. Uh, setting some other pins as outputs and then basically just listening for whenever the red button is pushed, turn on the red LED, the green button, the blue button, and then it happens, you know, it, it works with more than one at a time just like the other one does. Um, there is also some complexity that I'm hiding here in terms of the way that the buttons are wired and the LED is wired, uh, such that the buttons, when they're not pressed, are high. And in order to turn the LEDs on, you have to pull their pins to ground. So uh, it's kind of like the inverse of what you would think. Normally, you would think apply power to turn on the LEDs. Because of the way this LED is set up, it's actually the reverse. The nice thing is the buttons are the reverse, too, so I can still just do this digital read, digital write. Um, Anyway, that's all, that's all fine and good. Um, I mentioned the Arduino language before. It's simplified C. It's not really simplified. It's just that you don't use, uh, you don't use it the same way that you would use normal C. Um, it has a small standard library that allows you access to uh, extended functions like interfacing with I squared C or two wire uh, uh, parts. Uh, it has an EEPROM library. It has a matrix uh, LCD library. It has libraries for working with stepper motors. There's a lot of cool stuff, but it's all, it's all physical hardware stuff. The language is nice enough, but it's still C, and so it's still ugly. Here's where the beautiful code comes. Rad. Ruby Arduino development, which I mentioned earlier. It's a DSL that allows us to program the Arduino with Ruby. Um, what it does, uh, well, yeah, fairly young, getting better all the time. Uh, Greg, uh, like I said, Greg is uh, Greg Bornstein, the author of this, lives in Portland. Uh, he and I just met last week. Um, I'm working on this project now to kind of whip it into shape and get it uh, a little bit more powerful than it was uh, previously. When I say very young, it uh, he first demoed it at uh, the at Foscon this year. I think it was Foscon um, in Portland in July, and it was like two days old at that point. So uh, it's very young. Internally, it uses Ruby to C. So it actually, yeah, right, OK. <laughs> Eric's like, yeah. Um, I actually have a bone to pick with you about it later. Uh, what it does is it takes your Ruby code and it translates it using Ruby to C to, uh, to the C that compiles for the Arduino. It just happens that uh, it, it works really, really nicely. It really works well. Um, there are a little couple of niggly things. One of those things is that you can't use case statements, and I would assume that there are other pieces of the uh, of the Ruby syntax that you can't use. This is not Ruby to C's failing. Uh, well, I don't know. It might be. What Ruby to C does with the case statement is that it calls a bunch of functions to do the equality, and you have to define those functions yourself. And it just hasn't been done in Rad yet. So, anyway, you can do everything but case statements. Everything I've tried so far. Um, 
Oh, I guess that's what I was just talking about. Uh, oh, it supports pretty much all of the Arduino library. A note about RAD, the current version is 0.1.1. If you try and install it today, you're going to get 0.0.4 because the RubyGems indexer uh, on RubyForge is busted. And uh, they haven't been indexing new gems since, uh, I want to say, like the middle of last week. However, uh, you can download the gem from the project page, or I can give it to you today uh, if you want it. So take another look at the Arduino demo code here. Um, this, is, uh, this is the code that's running on this box right now that allows me to do this. So here's, this is the transition of Doom, so. Yeah, all right, anyway. Um, this is what it looks like in Ruby. It's a little under half the length, and it's a little bit more, uh, I think it's a little bit more straightforward. You declare the input pins as input pin, the pin number, the name you want to give them, and then you can pass this pull up true argument to it as well instead of doing a separate digital write, which uh, I just added like three days ago because it was driving me crazy having to do that. Output pins are declared in the same way. And that symbol you pass to as becomes a method on the other side and then obviously gets turned into a function in CLAN. So you can actually just call them by name down in the loop. So you define this loop method and uh, what when that runs, that gets turned into the loop function in the C. So um, that's pretty cool. I want to show you uh, really quick, uh, I'm actually going to do uh, the worst thing I could possibly do, which is a little live coding, um, just to kind of show you how, uh, how RAD works start to finish. So um, I'm going to no, start a new project here. So you just run rad uh, and, a, and a thing, and it'll create the, the project infrastructure that you need. So rubyconf test, and then it has this rubyconf test. It's named the same thing, uh, rb file. So we can just go in and edit that. And I'm going to say uh, output pin uh, 12 as, I'm sorry, um, 11, 12, 11 as red output pin 12 as green. Output pin 13 as blue def loop, and I'm going to digital write red false. False is uh, when it's translated, it's translated as zero. In Arduino, zero is the same as the constant low. So if you saw in the code earlier, I was setting it to high and setting it to low. Um, this is the equivalent of, of setting it low. Um, that will cause the LEDs to turn on, remember, because I, I told you how it was kind of weird before. False, red, blue, false. And then I can delay for, uh, we'll say, uh, 250 milliseconds. True, digital, right. Green, true, digital, right. Blue, true. Another delay. And then we can write this out. And we can just do rake, make, upload. It's got a, it's noisy, but oh, that's pretty. Yeah. Blinky, blinky. So that's all there is to that. Um, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, I now am also going to turn this one upside down because now this one's annoying. So that's how you can, uh, that's how quick it is to get going with red. So here's how you put it all together. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a couple minutes here talking about the, uh, some various small technologies that you can use with this hardware to integrate it into sort of a, uh, a sane system that you can communicate with. And um, yeah. So uh, XB and Arduino is love. Uh, the microcontroller on the Arduino has a UART, um, technically it has between two and four, I actually don't remember, but it doesn't really matter because there's only one that you can directly access when it's on an Arduino. Um, the, uh, the XB radio, as I mentioned earlier, is a UART to serial bridge that works wirelessly. So when you talk to it, uh, when you talk to the radio module, it takes everything it sees and it just sends it out to the world. And uh, vice versa, when it receives stuff from its, you know, the network that it has established with its peers, it will send it back to the device that it is connected to. 
So what that means in non-hardware geek talk is that if you slap an XB radio on top of an Arduino, uh, you've made it wireless. The question is how does that really work in practice? And that's that uh, this is, gets back to the module of hardware, which I said I'd mention again. Uh, so here it is. When you, um, when you looked at the, the Arduino picture that I had, there, there was that row of pins, right? And you, those things are used for uh, the shield concept. And this is going to be, we're going to see if this works. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Ah, wrong screen. Well, anyway. Um, this is what an Arduino XB shield looks like. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of visible. So um, you can just look at the back. It's got these rows of pins right here, and then a little, oh, geez, <laughs> a little another thingy right here. So you take an Arduino, which looks like this, and you take this, and you can basically just mate them together and now you have a wireless Arduino. So it looks like people are taking pictures. Should I wait for a minute? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that was that was pitched. <laughs> so um, I'd be happy to show this to anybody uh, later if you want to see it. Um, so effectively, what happens when you do that is it, it the XB shield basically sticks its little pins, <laughs> sticks its, its claws into the pins that the Arduino uh, puts its serial on. And by so doing, it intercepts the serial communications. The way that the, uh, the Arduino boards that I'm using work is uh, if you have an XB shield on there, the communication will go out the USB port, but it will also go out the XB. The interesting thing is that when you have it in that configuration, data that comes in the serial port will never make it to the microcontroller. So the outway works, but the inway doesn't via USB when you have the XB made. So all, if you want to program one of these, you have to pull the XB off, program it, put the XB back on, uh, which is, you know, it's the little, it's, it's the Arduino XB dance. Um, the XB shields are cheap. They're about 15 bucks shipped on eBay for a kit. Of course, that means that you have to solder it, uh, you know, so if you don't have soldering skills, you're going to want to buy one of these. However, and this is the only time you are ever going to hear me say this, don't buy this thing from SparkFun. Buy everything else from SparkFun, but don't buy an XB shield from them. The radios cost $20. The kits cost $15 to get them shipped. You have to spend a little time putting it together, or you can pay $80 to SparkFun to buy one of these. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, the, you can buy the equipment and take the time to learn how to solder for less than it would cost you to buy one of these things. So. Um, I mean, it's your money, do with, you, do with it as you please, but uh, they're robbing you. Um, so I don't, these slides are in a weird order. This is a photo of that if you couldn't see it well enough. So that's what it looks like. Spiffy. Simple message system. Um, this is a very small, very simple ASCII protocol uh, that you can use to control the main functions of an Arduino via a serial connection. And by main functions, I'm talking about uh, things like um, digital reads, digital writes, analog reads, analog writes, and um, analog writes, by the way, implemented via pulse width modulation, PWM, um, if you've heard of that before. And uh, that's pretty cool. The commands in a uh, simple message system look like this. So the first command there, WD101, there's spaces in between, and uh, you'll see this in a few minutes. You have to be sure to send uh, slash r slash n after that, uh, or else the, uh, the board won't realize the command is finished. What that first one does is it writes a, uh, basically a high to uh, pin 10. So it sets pin 10 high. In the example I'll show you here in a couple of minutes, what that's going to do is turn pin 10 on. Um, RA reads the analog pins. I'm not quite sure how that works. I think it gives you back um, an array of the values that it reads off uh, pin 0 through 5, which are the analog pins on an Arduino. You can also do RD, the digital. Uh, you could do a write analog. However, pin the, the board that I have set up, uh, I don't have anything plugged into the analog pins, so uh, analog writes won't do anything. Um, this is cool because basically it gives you an extremely simple way, extremely simple way, to control an Arduino remotely from a computer. So this is the first time, really, 
in terms of the Arduino boards that I've actually told you how to control it before it's just been programming. This, this is definitely, you program the uh, simple message system firmware and then you connect a serial port and put the device away. You never program it again. You just connect to it and issue commands. So this kind of leads into a more generalized discussion of building lightweight protocols. So the no really nice thing about serial is that you can send any kind of data down it that you want. Uh, so far we've been using ASCII, which is uh, what I re recommend. Um, ASCII is really simple. It's really easy for us as humans to understand. It's really easy to, to, to debug, especially in Ruby, because you can just open up IRB, open up a serial port, and just type in it exactly what you mean without having to do like a pack and pack dance to figure out what's going on. I really like pure ASCII protocols, provided you don't have to do anything too complex, they're really, really simple. Uh, as an illustration, when I was passing that box around the room, what it was doing is every 50 milliseconds, it was sending out a three character string, the letters R, G, and B. If they were capitalized, the device that I had up here knew that it had to turn on that color. So. Uh, Every 50 milliseconds, it would send a pulse, and every 50 milliseconds, I would look to see whether or not any of those were capitalized, and if they were, I would turn on those LEDs. It's really, really simple. It gets the job done. Obviously, it's a very trivial demo, but these kind of things are, uh, a lot of the time, what you're trying to accomplish when you're looking at actually controlling a device remotely. This kind of thing, just building a little protocol like this, I can't recommend it enough. I think it is absolutely the way to go provided that you can develop a protocol that does what you need it to do. Um, this will cause you to have the least amount of pain when you're debugging whatever system that you're trying to build. So this brings me finally to the Grand Unified Demo, which is uh, a demo of everything that's up here. And um, yeah, what I'm gonna do is show you a, uh, a framework and there's a lot of code to this. Um, I'm gonna try and show you the code, but there's a, it, it's fairly long. That uh, w opens up a DRB server and can accept notifications of when a build fails, and it will notify you via basically every piece of hardware that I've got up on the table right now that that build failed. So it's gonna take me a couple of minutes to get it set up, so uh, bear with me. Uh, if someone wants to bust out a soundtrack again, that would be awesome, because it, it worked really well last time. So um, actually, I lied. I am going to talk a little bit while I'm doing this. So uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I lied. Um, the first thing that I need to do is uh, reset and reallocate the, oh. No, this is the right tab. OK, I'm not doing that. Never mind. I'm going to go straight to the CI demo. Um, I need to set up, oh, you're killing me. Actually, I know what it is. I, un I unplugged, I have a USB hub that has like 20 things plugged into it, and I unplugged it. So. Uh, I'm going to reset the sign and reallocate the memory on it because it's, uh, it's set for something else right now. So in a second, you're going to see this sign go back to its, uh, its factory default. I'm sorry, this takes so long. So there we go. This is a lot of really stupid, you should buy more of our signs kind of animation. Um, then the set or uh, the allocation, which uh, when this finishes, you'll see the sign go blank. That's how you know that an allocation succeeded. Good. I know. It has the same effect on me. So now I'm going to set it up. Uh, this, what this is doing, the setup task, is programming the text files and the string files that go along with uh, this, this demo. And you'll see in a minute, it's going to start scrolling demo one unknown, demo two unknown, demo three unknown. It's probably doing that right now. Yeah? Nice. Yeah. Um, so that is, uh, that's that part of the demo. Now, uh, the, um, I do need to rewire this guy real quick. <laughs> Again, this one, uh, yeah. This. Next time, more hardware. Um,
I'm not talking right now because this is the board. I'm currently plugging stuff in. Isn't that exciting? Oh my god, it's all falling apart. <sighs> I'm really sorry about this, everybody. Yeah, I could use the soundtrack now if you're if you're into it. <laughs> god, and once again I want to take it back. <laughs> All right, so theoretically now, uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, those things are going to stay bright for a minute, but when you'll see in a minute, it's going to uh, get better. So now, I'm going to just start up the notification server, and it's going to take a minute, and it's going to reprogram the sign here. Uh, you'll see, you'll know that it's done reprogramming the sign because it's going to say, um, uh, Demo one, okay. Demo two, okay. Demo three, okay. Is it all three of them now? No. Okay, that's fine. It's. I'm gonna take a second and uh, do something else here. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna. Turn off the LEDs on that sign. Yeah, check that out. <laughs> so now I'm going to start another IRB session, required DRB. Um, so the notification server is listening on a 6821. So don't need it. It won't matter because it's only listening on localhost. So now I can say uh, Mark broken demo three. So what it's going to do now is it's going to reprogram the sign so it's going to say uh, demo one, okay, demo two, okay, demo three, broken. And then after it's done with that, it's going to uh, turn that red, turn that red, and turn on this red light. So now I can say, all right, that was cool. Uh, now I want, um, I made another check-in and I fixed demo three. Is this a broken on the sign too? Yeah. yeah. Nice. I like it when my demos work. So there you go. So um, that's, uh, let me see if I can actually show you this code briefly here. Um, what I'm doing, is that, is that big enough to read? Oh yeah, totally, of course. How is that? All right, um, opening up a bunch of serial ports here and uh, the um, one for the XB, one for the Borduino, which is my simple message system uh, device right here. Uh, and then one for each of the, well, they're not opening serial ports for these, but um, yeah. So there's a little project map that just tells you, uh, this is how it keeps its state as to which ones are okay, which ones are broken. Mark broken uh, actually shells out to another script. Because you have to open that serial port and sleep and close the serial port again, the most I've found the most uh, expedient way to get the sign updated is to shell out to another uh, process. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. Uh, update Betabrite, basically all it does is take a, the name of the project, or the, the actual string file ID of the project on the, uh, or of, yeah, of the string on the sign, and broken or fixed. So, um, and then down here, it's writing lowercase g, uppercase r, which, I was describing the protocol that the, uh, that the LEDs use. That's that protocol. So it's turning off green and on red. And then it's writing WD101 and WD120 to the simple message system device, which turns on pin 10 and off pin 12, uh, again, turning it red. 
And then um, if it's, so that happens anytime any of the projects are broken. When all of the projects are okay, then it uh, turns everything back green and switches the signs to green. And uh, yeah. Any questions? What's up? Does Jeff. this work with auto test? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, so the, the, the question is if it works with auto test. I'm sure you all heard that. Um, the, the DRB server was designed such that you could connect to it with anything. I personally don't use auto test because I am really bad. And uh, so I have not hooked up. I, I originally wanted to hook this up to cruise control and like give a real like uh, real CI server notification demo, but uh, it ended up not being worth it. So uh, I'm sure it could be. I just haven't done it. Yes. Just on that note, um, actually, this is pretty funny. The architect uh, on the I'm sorry. Can't hear you. Sorry. This is pretty funny. The architect on the team I'm on has that set up with uh, cruise control, uh, one build, all point to a magic orb in there. Yeah. Yeah, so um, just mentioning that uh, it's actually uh, pretty common to build these kind of continuous integration notifiers using things like the ambient orb device or uh, you said a magic orb. That's what I mean. Yeah, the, the ambient orb, which is just a, like a, a glass thing with uh, LEDs in it and they can change colors. Um, but this is just, uh, this is exactly the same thing. It's just we built this ourselves instead of spending 300 bucks on an ambient orb. So the question was whether or not I, I have ever tried to reverse engineer a serial protocol, and the answer is no, I have not. Um, however, I understand the principles of it, and you're going to need uh, an oscilloscope. You can, you can do it by uh, connecting the device um, to another serial port and just reading it, but the problem is that if there's any kind of handshake, you're going to have to figure out how to emulate that before you can do anything. And in order to do that, you're going to have to actually look at the electrical signals on the cable. Um, I would not be surprised if you can find documentation for that science protocol. You're, it's just going to take some doing. It took me a long time to find the docs uh, for the beta break. So. Anything else? I think I've got like maybe one more. Yeah. What's the cool hype stuff? I'm sorry? What's the, what's the cool but most difficult thing to do the, uh, that you struggle with? Uh, in this demo or in general? In general with hacking hardware and trying to write software in a basic way. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, there, uh, for me personally, because I am a software guy primarily, there's a lot of hardware stuff that happens when I don't really, I understand sort of vaguely the principle of it, but I, when something goes wrong, I have no way to know what it is. So like, I have, the, I have four of these uh, XB radios with me today, and only two of them are working right now, and I don't know why. So um, that kind of thing is, uh, is a challenge. Um, in, in terms of a more sort of non, uh, uh, non-chaos challenge. Um, a lot of it is just kind of trying to figure out how, trying to plan the whole system. I mean, when you're, when you're designing a software system, you have, you know, you know that you're, you're within the land of software. When you're developing a hardware system, you're doing a hardware system. When you're trying to design both that can talk to each other and will be robust, it just pretty drastically increases the complexity of the whole system, which, I mean, it's, it's obvious, but I find that to be very challenging. Um, I actually, I'm completely self-taught from the internet networking people. So uh, I have heard that the M. Forrest Mims, uh, anybody know the title of that book? It's like Electronics Workbook or something. Uh, I'll post links. Oh, by the way, these slides along with a list of uh, URLs will be up on my blog in a few days. I don't know when. Um, and then the video too. Make magazine is a good Yeah, definitely. Get a subscription to Make for sure. Um, read the Make blog uh, and um, Spark check out. Spark Fun also has good tutorials. Too. I'm sorry? Spark Fun also has good Spark tutorials. Fun has good tutorials. I would also read um, LadyAda.net, everything that she has ever written. Yeah. Do you know if the Make controller has anything like this going for it? A little more? A little louder. Do you know if the Make controller has anything like this going for it? Um, the, the Make controller, uh, I do not. Uh, the Make controllers are really expensive, so I don't know. I think I'm, I think I'm totally out of time. Thanks, everybody.